I worked at a gas station for a couple years in my mid-30s. I've always had jobs that barely let me scrape by, so working at a gas station wasn't much better or worse than many of my other previous employments. If you've ever worked at or been to a gas station at night, then you know that there's always only one employee. Maybe larger gas stations have multiple, but with my experience it was always only one person. There was never anything to do, so you really only needed a single person, but it definitely made it eerie sometimes while being there alone. I'd stand and look out the window by the counter, seeing only the dim lights by the pumps with a field of darkness behind them. The location of the station I worked at was on the edge of town, a few minutes from any other buildings. We'd get a lot of traffic from truck drivers and cars that would travel between the cities, which was very common for work in the area. When this happened to me though, it was the beginning of spring and had been raining quite a lot. What's great about when it rains is that most people choose to pay with a card instead of cash, meaning far less people would actually enter the store. It was raining heavily this night, and very few cars were even coming up to fill their tanks. I guess we weren't busy in the daytime either, because all the shelves were fully stocked, leaving me with absolutely nothing to do but sit there and wait for the clock to run down. Past midnight, I was seeing maybe one or two cars pull up every hour. One man actually came in to pick up a pack of smokes, but that was it. After that, I was fighting hard to stay awake. It wasn't even that I was tired, I was just extremely bored. But then a car rolled into the station, followed by another, and then another. What are the odds, right? I started paying attention, watching through the side window. None of the people got out, they all just stayed in their cars right next to the pumps keeping their cars running. After a few minutes, I thought I might actually have to go out there and tell them that it's dangerous to leave their cars on next to the pumps, but then a few doors opened and a few people got out. Five people total exited the cars. They were all men and were wearing thick winter type jackets. Leaving their cars on still, they began walking up to the door. All of the men made eye contact with me as they entered while I stood at the counter. I'm not going to try to make myself sound brave or anything, because I was shitting bricks at this point. Just the fact that they left their cars on was a clear enough sign of what was about to happen. One of the men came up to the counter, while the other four scattered around the store. How's your night going, bud? The man spoke with confidence. I looked around his shoulders, seeing the other men grabbing handfuls of product and shoving them into their backpacks. The confidence they had in what they were doing, not even yelling commands at me or holding me at gunpoint, made me absolutely terrified, probably more so than if I actually was held at gunpoint. They knew I couldn't do anything, so they didn't even bother to go through the effort of dealing with me. Everything going through my head, I never even answered the man. We'll be gone in a couple minutes. Everything will be fine, the guy said. One of the other men came up and jumped over the counter. Open it. I did as he said, letting him take the cash from the register. Being at night though, there was barely anything in there. The guy held up a few dollar bills, showing the man on the other side of the counter. Where's the rest? We don't have any more. My boss makes sure it's mostly empty before we switch shifts. Of course, the man did not look satisfied with that answer. He stared at me for what felt like an entire minute. But then he smiled. Have a good night, bud. He motioned to the others and they walked back to their cars and drove off. Without hesitation, I called the police. I was almost 100% sure that they were about to hit a nearby gas station in an effort to grab more cash. I alerted them of my concerns, and they sent multiple officers to that location, as well as an officer to mine. It turned out I was right. They did go to the neighboring gas station, but the officers arrived too late. The worker there had been robbed clean and had some mild injuries, but from what I heard he was mostly okay. It's been years since this happened, and thankfully I never saw them again, though I'm unsure if they ever got caught and arrested. I feel really guilty for some reason about that other gas station worker that got hurt, mostly because I didn't get physically harmed in any way. I don't know the full story of what went down at their station, 
but I feel lucky that it didn't go that way for me. Maybe the worker tried to fight back, or maybe he didn't, I don't know. But sometimes, I think it's just best that you accept you're in a bad situation, and that there's nothing you can do. For reference, I'm a 23-year-old female. The story took place when I was 17 years old and home alone when my parents took a trip out of the U.S. to Toronto, Ontario. We lived there for three years for my father's job when I was a child, so they were visiting old friends that they had made when we lived there. My older brother was out of state in college at the time, so I was alone for the week. It was a Friday night, and one of my good guy friends was supposed to spend the night with me so that I wasn't alone for the weekend. Something came up and he had to return home for the night, leaving me home alone. I wasn't worried or nervous at all because I'd been staying home alone since I was 12 years old, and as I got older, I had spent several nights alone. My friend ended up leaving at around 10 that night. I texted my mom letting her know that he had to leave and that I'd be alone for the night now. She told me it was fine but to just be careful and make sure the alarm was on. So I got ready for bed and I decided to sleep in my parents' bedroom because they had a huge TV in their room with cable access, which I didn't have in my room. I turned the house alarm on, got in bed, and started looking for a movie on cable to watch. My dog was lying on the bed with me, so I knew she couldn't have done anything to cause what happened next. About an hour had passed, and I was flipping through the channels when my house alarm suddenly went off. I immediately looked at the alarm unit by the bedroom door and saw the red light was flashing on and off. I froze. It was a very loud and repetitive beeping sound. I think it took me about 15 seconds just to process what was happening. Didn't the alarm just go off by itself? I thought. There's no way a door opened. Immediately, I started thinking of anyone and everyone I knew that could have possibly opened one of the doors to my house with a key. You know, since all of the doors were locked. I knew my brother wasn't coming home for the weekend. I knew it wasn't my friend who had recently left because I just received a text saying he was home. I went through all of my friends that I could think of, and every single one of them was either out of town or busy. I knew none of my neighbors would have opened any of the doors either. I went through all of this in my head in that 15 seconds that I was frozen on the bed. Finally, I snapped out of it and I ran to my parents' bedroom door, closed it, and then locked it. I refrained from turning the alarm off because I knew that it automatically calls the police once it hits one minute of going off, and I was also thinking the loud alarm would scare away whoever just broke into my house. After I locked the door, I went to my mom's night table and took out a revolver that she kept in there just in case of emergencies like this one. Now I'm only about 5 foot 4, and I knew that if anyone came through that door had the intention of hurting me they would have easily succeeded. I wasn't taking any chances. I took out the gun, made sure it was loaded, and took the safety off. I held the gun up and I pointed it at the door, but kept my finger off the trigger, as you're supposed to do until you know for a fact you're going to shoot. I couldn't believe that I was holding a gun and pointing it at something, and possibly someone, with the intention to shoot if they proved to be dangerous. I sat there mentally preparing myself to shoot whoever managed to get through the door. This is something I never thought I'd have to do. I remained calm and I didn't let my emotions or fear get the better of me. I knew I needed to stay quiet and keep my head clear in case something actually happened. I was kneeling on the floor in this position for what felt like forever, but I'm sure only about two minutes truly passed. The alarm was still going off, and I decided that I would call 911 just in case the alarm system malfunctioned and didn't call the police. I dialed 911, explained to them everything that was going on, and they sent two police officers my way. The dispatcher stayed on the phone with me until the cops got there. They checked the exterior perimeter of my house before knocking on the front door. I turned off the alarm and then put the gun away. 
I opened the front door and talked to the officers. They told me they found no sign of a break-in on the outside of the house. They asked me a few questions about what happened, and I explained everything to them. They again asked me if I wanted to do a sweep of the interior of the house just to see if anyone had broken in and possibly hid somewhere. Looking back, I cannot believe how stupid my answer was. No, I think it's okay now. The cops assured me they would remain in the area, and they told me not to hesitate to call back if anything else happened. I walked them out, locked the door behind them, and went back into my parents' room. I made sure my dog wasn't spooked at anything that happened, being that she's a 20-pound Cocker Spaniel, and not exactly the guard dog type. I then proceeded to finally call my parents and then tell them what happened. My mom has always been an extremely calm person, so she didn't panic, and I guess I have to thank her for my calm attitude during all of this, because I'm along like her in that sense. My dad, however, was very clearly worried about me, being that I was his young daughter home alone. They asked me if I was okay and if I wanted them to come home early. I told them that wasn't necessary, and I'm sure nothing like that would happen again since the alarm probably scared them off. I hung up the phone with my parents, and I realized that I hadn't turned the alarm back on. So I went to the alarm system, entered the code, and pushed set. Nothing happened. It wasn't turning back on. I was confused at first, but then I realized the alarm doesn't turn on unless every door in the house is completely shut. My heart dropped. Shit! I muttered out loud. I had the realization that I had to now go around the house and look for what door had been opened and set the alarm off in the first place. This is when I truly realized how stupid I was to tell the police officers no when they asked if I wanted them to search the interior of the house. I went back in my mom's night table and picked up the gun, again mentally preparing for the worst. I then went to every door on the ground level of my house, holding the gun in both of my hands. I finally made it to the hallway where the door entering our garage was, and it was there that I saw the door to the garage had been left wide open. Chills went through my body at the thought that someone had actually tried to break in, and they succeeded. Now, we had two ground level windows in our garage, so someone coming through there to get into the house was not far fetched. I turned the light on in the garage and held the gun in front of me. I looked at the two windows in the garage and there didn't seem to be any sign that they were opened. I immediately shut the door to the garage, locked it, and tried turning the alarm on again. It worked this time. After this, I went through the entirety of the house with the gun in hand to check if anyone had hidden anywhere. I prayed the entire time that I wouldn't find anyone and that I really wouldn't have to use that gun. And to my relief, I found nothing and no one. I slept with my parents' bedroom door locked that night, and with the revolver under my pillow for the rest of the week. When my parents returned home from the trip, my father inspected the windows in the garage to see if they had been forced open or anything like that. As I figured, there was no evidence of a forced entry. My parents concluded that the door to the garage must have not been shut all the way, and a gust of wind came from outside through the garage, and then swung the door to the house open, causing the alarm to go off. We never figured out what actually happened that night. Since then, I have had one more experience with a possible break-in when I was in college, and I came home for the weekend. That story wasn't as scary, but I was alone again and my parents were doing the same thing during the first time, visiting friends in Canada. I'm now 23 years old. Six years have passed since that night, and whatever it was, whatever truly happened, well, it continues to be the scariest night of my life. I can't even bring myself to imagine what would have happened if we didn't have that alarm system, and if I didn't have my mom's gun to feel safer. Although nothing bad ended up actually happening, I advise everyone hearing this story to always make sure your home has an alarm and to always, always keep a gun in the home to protect yourself. My name is Angelo and I'm 16. 
Around three months ago, my parents left me alone due to them heading to a wedding. I live with my family and dogs, Coco, Marshall, Sky, and Rubble. Marshall and Sky are pit bulls, so I had nothing to fear if someone broke in. A couple of hours after my parents left, I let Marshall and Sky outside to do their business. I heard barking outside, and I went to check on them when I saw a woman who was around five foot five and in her late thirties standing on the other side of the fence looking at my dogs. You have such beautiful dogs. Can I pet them? The woman said to me. I was about three feet away from the fence, but I could smell cigarettes coming off her clothes. Sorry, they don't really like being pet, but thanks for the compliment. I said to the woman while hurrying my dogs inside. She then gave me this glare, a glare that still haunts me to this day. When my dogs were inside, I made sure the doors were locked and I checked that the woman was gone. When I didn't see her, I rushed all of my dogs to a room that was the farthest away from the backyard door. I texted my mom that there was a strange woman outside trying to pet our dogs. Now, I forgot to mention, but there's apartments right next to our neighborhood and we had a fair share of people stopping and looking at our dogs. But something about this woman made me and my dogs feel really unnerved. My mom said that they wouldn't be heading home anytime soon, but to be safe. A few minutes later, I had heard the doorbell, and all of the dogs went crazy. My bedroom is fairly large, but all of the dogs moving around was crazy. I decided not to bother to see who was outside and to just stay with the dogs. Me and the dogs were watching a movie, but I then heard clicks in my window. I paused the movie and I was starting to freak out internally, wondering if it was that same lady trying to break in. And then I heard a loud crash. I mustered up the courage to look out the window. I pulled back the curtains and what I saw was shocking. I saw that same woman breaking into my neighbor's house. I quickly closed the curtains and called 911 on the phone. I stayed quiet as to not alert the woman. The operator said that the police would get there in about two minutes, but I then heard a shriek coming from my neighbor's house. I looked out my window and I saw my neighbor attacking the woman who was then screaming at the top of her lungs. I was still on the phone and I had told the operator that my neighbor was now fighting against the woman. By now the police got there and they had to taser the woman for how violent she was. She was spouting swears that would make a sailor blush and she was moving uncontrollably. The police took a knife and what looked to be a gun away from the lady. She started to say that she was going to kill me and my dogs and burn my house down. I think she was high and thought that my neighbor's house was mine due to how similar the houses looked. I was stunned, looking out my window, while the thought of what that woman would do to me and my dogs if she got me. I then started to cry, holding my dogs close to me. I didn't know what to do, so I kinda just sat there until I fell asleep. I had heard my parents opening my door, saying they were home. I didn't know what to say but I then told them to talk to the neighbors next to us. Days went by, and now they insist that I can't stay home alone anymore. I can't get the image of her glare out of my head, and I now sleep with both of my pit bulls just to feel safe. I know I'll be safe now, but knowing what that woman was capable of doing just scares me. If that woman didn't break into my neighbor's house and broke into mine instead, I just know me and my dogs would be dead. Stay safe out there. My family lives across the states in a small house. I try to visit often, given I usually get a lot of vacation time from my work. The drive is something I find relaxing, so I don't mind the extra couple days it takes to get there. Most of the time, I try to stay at one hotel or motel along the way, and when I do, I just check in, sleep, and get back on the road as soon as I'm able. It's mainly because the areas along the drive are bare and run down, usually in the middle of nowhere. I find it hard to feel safe since I'm not used to being in those kinds of areas. 
Last year, I took the same road trip I always did to my parents' house during the holiday season. I started my drive early, I want to say around 1 or 2 a.m., and drove for almost 20 hours straight, aside from stopping for food and coffee a few times. By then it was 11 p.m., and I was exhausted and struggling to stay awake behind the wheel. I was just under 8 hours away, but I couldn't go much further. I was in the middle of nowhere, so whatever the next possible place to stay at was, I planned on taking it. About 20 minutes further, I turned off into a small town. It pretty much just had a motel and gas station, but that was all I needed. I pulled into the mostly empty parking lot and walked over to the front desk. An older lady greeted me and made small talk, then I got a room and headed back to my car so I could park closer to the door. I was extremely exhausted and left all of my stuff in the car and just went inside. I didn't care about the room at all, I just went inside and immediately got in the shower so I could get ready for bed as soon as possible. During my quick 5 minute shower, I heard a few tapping sounds. They sounded like they were from outside though, maybe a tree branch knocking against the building. I thought nothing of it and got out, putting on the same comfortable clothes I was wearing, then got in bed. I set an alarm on my phone so I wouldn't oversleep and finally reached for the lamp and turned off the light. Being at an old, run-down motel in the middle of nowhere seemed irrelevant compared to how tired I was, so I fell asleep without trouble. Though, I didn't stay asleep for long. I jumped awake, hearing something move in the darkness surrounding the bed. I sat up, staring toward the front door, but I could barely see anything. I was too scared to move and reach for the light, afraid of what I might see. It wasn't long before I heard something from the other side of the bed, outside the window. My heart was racing, and I could feel myself starting to sweat, as I was wide awake at this point. I quickly turned back around and switched on the light. The room was empty, nothing seemed out of place, until I noticed the closet door was cracked open. Everything was going through my mind, trying to understand every possibility. Hello? I decided to call out, but there was no response. Feeling like I may have just scared myself for no reason, I got up and slowly walked towards the closet. When I pulled the closet door more open, I was confused. A large bag was wedged between the back of the closet and the door, falling to the ground as I opened it further. Looking around, there was actually a whole stash of luggage. Clothes, bags, appliances, all clearly belonging to someone, not the typical stuff you would see at a motel. While I was looking at all this stuff, I suddenly heard the window slam shut by my bed, followed by footsteps running away. I shivered and froze, then took this chance to grab my phone from the nightstand and run out to my car. Almost just as I got inside and turned the car on, I looked up and made eye contact with a man standing right by the door to the room. He looked at me for a second, then rushed inside and grabbed one of the large bags from the closet and sprinted off behind the building. I was terrified and quickly drove closer to the front office, then ran inside to tell the woman what had happened. She contacted the police immediately and locked us both inside the office until they arrived. What we found out next was confusing, and the information came out over multiple weeks, but I'll try to explain it the best I can. The remaining bags in the closet were identified, as they were found to belong to several individuals who were robbed within the past month at several different motel locations in the surrounding area. It's likely that the man was using the room I was in as a place to temporarily stash the belongings, using the unlocked window to access the room. One of those bags, however, belonged to a young woman who was reported missing just a few weeks prior, and the officers believe the crimes are connected. But, all the reported bags that were stolen were found inside that closet, so the bag that the man ran inside to grab was not accounted for. They questioned me on it multiple times, making sure I was confident that I saw him run out with another bag, and asking me the approximate size of it and everything. My curiosity has really kept my mind from being able to forget that night, as I wonder what he planned on doing when he was outside the window while I was sleeping. I knew it was closed when I went to bed, so he had to have opened it while I was asleep, which is even creepier. 
I also wonder what was in that one bag that was so important that he needed to grab it before running off. I don't go on many vacations, nor do I stay at hotels often, but last year I had a problem occur in my small house that required me to be away for several days for it to be fixed. Given the circumstances, I had to book a hotel nearby and stay there until further notice. I wasn't happy about it, but there wasn't anything I could do and nowhere else I could stay. I looked for the absolute cheapest hotel in the area, trying to save as much money as possible. The one I went with was 25 minutes away, but was half the price of the ones closer. Although I knew it was because the hotel was located in the lesser part of the town, the extra money saved more than made up for it in my mind. That was until I got there. The place was disgusting, at least on the outside. Trash was everywhere and the building was very clearly not taken care of. The pictures online only showed the rooms in the lobby, but they looked clean and somewhat nice, so I was a little bit confused. I grabbed my small suitcase from my back seat and walked inside. Immediately when entering, I was relieved. The lobby was very small, but it was nice and clean. I headed for the counter to check in, but nobody was standing there. I stood patiently for a minute, looking around the main room. It was very quiet and not a single person was anywhere. It was only 4pm, so I assumed people would be walking around or hanging out in the lobby. I took a few steps further into the hotel, looking down the main hallway leading to the rooms. At the very end was a man, standing right outside a room door. After watching him for a few seconds, it was apparent that he was just facing the door, not moving or anything. Feeling uncomfortable, I backed up to the front counter again. Finally, a man came from outside and walked behind the counter. Honestly, he looked dead inside. He asked for my name and gave me the keycard, then walked away. I glanced at the card, seeing the room number written with a marker in the corner. Given the low number, I knew it was on the first floor. I walked over to the hallway I was just at and looked at the directions for where the rooms were, and my stomach ached a bit when I realized it was down the hallway where I'd seen that man. Even worse, as I started making my way down, I realized it was at the end of the hallway, right where the man was standing. I couldn't tell if he was standing outside my exact room or not because of how far he was when I saw him, but it was creepy either way. Although I hadn't been to many hotels previously, I do remember the annoyance of the thin walls allowing you to hear every noise from every room. What was strange as I walked down the hall was that there was no noise coming from any room. No TVs were on, nobody was talking, no movement, nothing. It gave me chills, but when I reached my door, I quickly scanned the card and headed inside. Given everything, it was actually in good condition. It was very small and was clearly old, but it was exactly what I expected of the cheap room. I laid my suitcase down on the floor, then took a look into the bathroom to make sure it was good, and finally locked the door and sat on the couch. Not at all surprised, the TV didn't work though, so I was left with just my phone. After an hour of trying to keep myself occupied, a knock came from the door. It startled me, given it was just a single knock, which sounded more like a hit. The door had no peephole, so when I got there, I flicked the safety latch over just in case and opened the door a crack. That same man from earlier was standing in the hallway, only a foot or so from the door. We made eye contact through the crack in the door. Hi, did you need something? Yeah. I paused, waiting for him to tell me what, but he just stood there like he was waiting for me to say something. Um, okay man, what do you need then? I said, in a way to show that I was clearly bothered by him. The strange man responded, claiming he was the previous person staying in my room and that he had accidentally left something important inside one of the drawers. I said okay and told him I would grab it real quick and began closing the door and turning around, but the man pushed the door back, slamming it against the safety latch. I looked back at him, my heart starting to race as I was getting a really bad feeling about this. It's in the top dresser drawer. 
The man muttered to me, then backed up, letting the door close. I turned back around, heading to the dresser and opening the top drawer. Inside, there was actually a small-sized box taped shut on the top. Picking it up, it was fairly light though. I mean, like it felt empty. I walked back over to the door and opened it, seeing the man still standing there. Is this what you were looking for? I asked. The man nodded and held his hand out. I went to slip the box through the crack in the door, but it was barely too big. I tried every possible angle, probably looking like an idiot, but it was just slightly too wide on every side. The man looked impatient, and while I really didn't trust this place, at the moment, I thought the guy had told the truth about leaving something behind, and I did see him standing by the door before, so I figured it'd be fine to open the door for a second just to hand him the box. As soon as I moved the latch over, the man rammed his body into the door, knocking me down and pulling a gun on me. He yelled at me to back up into the living room and stand against the wall. I was actually stunned at how loud he was screaming thinking surely he would alarm everyone in the building. He grabbed my whole suitcase and continued looking around while holding the gun at me. Then, just when he was about to leave, he walked up to me, put the pistol just inches from my face, and stared me in the eyes. I was shaking in fear, staring into this man's rage-filled eyes, but after a few seconds, he backed up and ran away with my stuff. I stood in that same spot for probably a whole minute, staring at the ground. It happened so fast, it almost didn't even seem real. When I finally got myself together, I went outside my room and went straight to the front desk. The guy there was just casually standing there like he didn't hear anything, and nobody else was in sight. To sum everything up, nothing was done. He got away with all of my stuff. And honestly, every authority figure I talked to didn't seem scared or surprised in any way. They kind of just looked at me like I didn't even belong here anyways. I guess it was just normal, and they expect you to look out for yourself. The box was in fact empty though, and the whole thing was obviously just an interesting plot to rob those who stayed at the hotel. Those last moments before the man ran away though, are what I keep thinking back to. The rage in his eyes, holding the gun up like he was ready to pull the trigger without thinking twice. Why didn't he? My only thought was that maybe he knew that if it was just a robbery, then nobody would come looking. I don't know, but I definitely won't be staying at a cheap hotel in a bad neighborhood ever again. This happened while I was on a work trip. I work for an insurance company, and we can win trips to our other two big locations, one of which happens to be in Miami. I won the trip and went with my boss and a few other people in the company. Most of the trip was spent doing work stuff during the day, and then at night we were left to do what we wanted, like go to the hotel pool, bars in town, and all that other stuff. It was the second to last night I was there. And I didn't have much to do the next day, so me and a co-worker went out to a cool looking bar on 1st Street. We took an Uber and got there around 11pm. Miami is a party city, and the nightlife there is amazing. The bar was packed and it made me feel like I was in college again. I wasn't that old, but I'd been out of college for a few years now. My coworker gets us shots, and throughout the night we have some more, and he ends up inviting two girls to the table and buys them shots as well. He hits it off with one of them, and the other one seems to take a liking to me. I'd been single for quite some time, and work had taken over my life, so I was honestly just excited someone was showing interest in me. Plus I was on vacation, and she says she was too, so neither of us were expecting anything serious out of this. I thought she was really cool and extremely attractive, and throughout the night I offered to buy her drinks but she bought her own which I thought was really cool too. It was around 2am now and she asked if I wanted to go back to her hotel, which I found out was only a 15 minute walk from mine. I agreed but honestly was pretty nervous. I knew this girl was way out of my league but I decided to have fun and take a chance. We Ubered back to her hotel, which was insanely nice by the way and got to the room. I'll spare you the details, but events occurred and afterwards we ended up talking for a bit. 
After a while, I noticed she was starting to get glued to her phone, so I went to the bathroom to clean up and get dressed. But while I was in there, I heard a keycard open the door to the room and was confused. She never mentioned that she was here with anyone, and I didn't see anyone else's stuff in the room either. And that's when I heard a man's voice. My heart dropped to my stomach. I quickly got dressed and checked if I had everything. I had my phone and wallet which were in my pants pocket, but my shoes were still out there. I decided I'd have to leave them, as I could not deal with whatever this is right now. While I was waiting for my time to slip out, I heard him ask why there's men's shoes by the bed. That's when I knew I was screwed. By the time I made the decision to make a run for it, there was a pounding on the bathroom door. It was one of those doors that slide open and doesn't really lock, so of course the cheap thing revealed me behind it. This guy was huge. I could not have been more unlucky if I tried. The cherry on top was he also had a gun and was pointing it right at me. He told me to get my shit and get out in the most calm voice that made everything ten times scarier. I grabbed my shoes and left, my heart beating out of my chest. He closed the door behind me and then silence. I didn't hear any fighting or yelling or anything, which I thought was weird, but I wasn't going to stay to find out. I got in the elevator and took my wallet out to get my key card, and what do you know, all my cash was gone, my credit card, my debit card, even my gift cards were taken. I don't even know when she had the time to take all this stuff and how I didn't notice. I tried thinking back to the bar and going into the room, but the night had turned into a blur. I spent the next hour cancelling my cards, pissed that for the rest of the trip I would have absolutely no money. The next day I told my boss and co-workers, who sympathized but also found it funny. And now that it's been a few years since that incident, I can look back and find the humor in it. But what stuck with me was one of my friends theorized it might have been a setup. That might not have been her boyfriend at all. She could have taken me back to the hotel, stole my stuff, and waited till I went to the bathroom for the guy to come in and scare me off before I noticed the money was gone. If that's the case, it would explain why I didn't hear any fighting after I left and why the guy wasn't more angry. I try not to think about it too hard, and anytime I go out, which isn't much anymore, I try to keep myself safer and make better decisions. I used Craigslist many years ago to find a room for rent. I was looking for a house to stay at and be able to split rent with a roommate or roommates. It took maybe a week to find a place that was suitable for me and several phone calls with the owner before I was ready to move in. The owner who was to be my roommate seemed like a really normal, nice guy who was similar in age as me. He told me all about the place and what to expect and I also felt like we connected well. With everything seeming perfect, I was getting really excited. I didn't have much to move, so I packed it all up and stuffed it in the trunk of my car, and in just a few days, I drove out 30 minutes to my soon-to-be home. It was located outside of the main town, and in more of a woodsy terrain. It had a long driveway, leading far from the road. Pulling in though, it was not as I'd expected. It was a very old, wooden home. I knew it was passed down from his parents, but this place looked to be at least a hundred years old. The pictures of the inside that I'd seen on Craigslist looked to be fairly modern, so I assumed they had to have done some pretty big renovations. I left everything in my car as I went up to the door and knocked. Aaron, the owner, came and showed me around. While the outside was not so impressive, the inside was the opposite. Very well maintained, clean, and definitely had been renovated not long ago. I was really happy with everything and moved my things in that night. Several days went by with no issues. It didn't even feel like I'd found this place on Craigslist. It felt like I was just living with a friend. Aaron worked in town though, so he was gone most of the time and I worked from home, so I got to have the whole house to myself. Well, not the whole house. There was one door that was always locked. 
It wasn't any of my business, and I knew that, so I never brought it up with Aaron. But, it still got me wondering. It was almost definitely the basement door, but this was odd because he said the house was a one-story home, not mentioning anything about having a basement. Another couple days went by, before something happened. Aaron brought home some fast food for dinner, and then went to bed early because he had work the next day. I stayed up a while longer, then did the same. Laying in bed though, I had trouble falling asleep. There wasn't any reason for this, it was just one of those nights. But after a while, I heard Aaron's bedroom door open. I was listening, because there was nothing else to do, but no sounds came. I waited a whole two or three minutes before he started walking, slowly down the hall towards my door. Just as he was passing though, he stopped. I heard the floorboards creak, followed by the door thump softly, as if he was pressing up against it. He stayed there behind the door for a while, I don't even know how long, but then he walked away. Not back toward his room, but the other way, toward the main hallway. Then a door opened, and closed. I didn't know what to think. It was really weird and creepy, but also I'd known Aaron for a while now, and didn't see him as a weird person. But, what was he doing? And where did he go? I stayed awake as long as I could, waiting to hear him come back, but he never did. Over the next few nights, I noticed a pattern. Every time I would go to bed, about 30 minutes later, Aaron would open his door, stand still for a minute, then walk to my door, stand still again, then leave and go into the locked door. He never slept in his room. He always slept somewhere behind the weird locked door. What made it so creepy was that he was trying so hard to keep a secret from me. I decided one night that I was going to figure this all out, because I was beginning to feel unsafe. I went to bed and waited for Aaron to do his usual routine. He opened his bedroom door and walked over to mine. Then, as soon as I heard him unlock and open the other door, I got up and quickly went into the hallway, catching him standing by the open door. He looked back at me, clearly startled. Hey, is everything okay, Aaron? I asked. He just stared at me, eyes still open wide from the scare I gave him. Why do you keep going to that door every night? I broke the silence, getting impatient. We were standing on opposite sides of the long dark hallway, but I could sense that something was wrong with him. We stared at each other still, and I took a step closer. Aaron? As soon as I spoke his name, he ran around the corner and straight to the back door, opening it and continuing to run for the trees. I looked out the back door, seeing him disappear into the dark woods. I was shaking, horrified at what just happened. I have no words to describe the unknown thoughts running through my head. I closed the back door, then grabbed a knife from the kitchen and walked over to the door Aaron had opened. It was in fact a basement, but there was no light switch and it clearly had not been renovated like the rest of the house. The walls were old, decaying wood. I debated whether or not to go down. I was so intrigued and curious, but terrified as well. The longer I stood there, the more afraid I became. I turned and ran back to my room, packed everything I could into two suitcases, stuffed them in my car, and drove away, never looking back. I never talked to Aaron again, and he never tried to contact me either. I didn't know what was going on with him, or what he was doing in that house, but I didn't want to be involved. After a while, I forgot about it. But almost five years later, I found myself wondering about it again. I looked up the house online and found some strange things. It had been torn down years ago. There was an article from five years ago, just a few months after I left, 
stating that the house was abandoned. To me, this meant that when Aaron ran away that night, he never came back. I kept reading, and it stated that the house was torn down due to what they described as criminal findings. It didn't go into any more detail about what those criminal findings were. This really had me shaken up for a few weeks. Things like this probably wouldn't happen nowadays, but you can never be too careful. I'm a 25 year old male, and this happened to me three years ago. I had just signed a lease for a small house in the town I lived in. Having been living in an apartment for a few years, I didn't have a lot of furniture or large house decorations to fill the space in my rental. While I had a decent sized couch and TV stand, I only had a mini TV that I wanted to put up in my bedroom since it was so small. Not having a ton of money to work with though, I took to Craigslist to find a larger TV for the living room. I found a few nice flat screen TVs listed on the site. They were all over my budget though, and honestly, a lot nicer than I actually needed. I just wanted a large TV to fill the space in my living room. I didn't actually care about the quality of the picture on the TV. Anyway, I finally found one that seemed to work with what I needed. It was cheap, large, and was said to be in working condition. It was an old flat screen TV from probably 10 years ago. Compared to today, they aren't even considered flat screens anymore as they're usually 3-4 to four inches thick and really heavy. I sent the owner an email and continued with my search. Finding nothing else worth looking into, I just hoped for the best with that one TV. It wasn't until the following morning that I received a response to my email. The owner introduced himself as Mitch and said he'd love to show me the TV whenever I was available. I don't know if I just read it in a weird way or what, but he seemed to be over the top excited about this. It made me a little uncomfortable, but I just figured it was a happy old man or something. I said I could do any day this week after I got off work at 6, and Mitch said tomorrow at 6.30 would be perfect for him, leaving his address at the bottom of the email, along with a Google Calendar invite to an event labeled as Craigslist TV. I accepted it, though I wasn't really sure what the purpose of it was, and it was definitely not a normal thing people do, but it didn't affect me in any way. I got my truck emptied out and the next day I went to work, then went straight to his address afterwards. It was dark out by now, and when I pulled into his driveway, I saw all the lights were on inside. I checked one last time to make sure I had all the cash on hand, then got out of my truck and went to the front door. Walking up, I could see that the front door was partially open. There was no screen door or anything, just one main door. Thinking it was left open for me, I leaned over and peeked inside, but didn't see anyone, so I rang the doorbell. Right when the bell rang, I heard something drop on the far end of the house, then it went quiet. There was something about that noise that made me start getting nervous. After a moment, I decided I had a bad feeling about this and was just going to leave. But then footsteps came from behind the door, which then opened slightly wider, revealing a man. Need something? He said, half his body still behind the door. Oh, uh, yeah, I was here to look at your TV. We scheduled for 6.30 today. The man looked at me for a second. Alright. He opened the door completely and let me inside. I will say, at that moment I knew something was wrong. He wasn't acting at all like he was in the emails. I expected a happy old man, not a large, grumpy, middle-aged dude. But I was already inside by the time all the alarms were going off in my head. The TV was in the room right next to the door, so he stood there while I looked at it. Uh, yeah, this looks good. I'll take it, I said, not even knowing if it worked or not, but I wanted to get this over with quickly. I held out the money. He looked at it for a moment, then back at me. He reached out and took it, then shoved it in his pocket, and without giving me any time to react, 
He grabbed me by the shoulder and shoved me back towards the door, yelling at me to leave. I didn't argue. I sprinted out to my truck and drove away. Not long after, I pulled to the side and called the police to let them know I'd been robbed. The whole time, I was just thinking about how stupid they were, meeting me at their own house, robbing me, and letting me go, knowing that I knew where they lived. But when the police got to the house and called me back, I was in complete shock, hearing what they told me. Over that week though, things became more clear. The man I met at the house was not Mitch. Mitch, the owner of the house, was found unconscious in the kitchen. Thankfully he survived, though he had some pretty bad injuries. The man I met at the door was another customer Mitch was meeting from Craigslist to pick up some kitchenware he was also selling. He ended up beating and robbing Mitch, likely just minutes before I showed up. What's even crazier is that Mitch had sent that man a Google Calendar invite as well, and the man accepted it, probably unknowing that it showed his email, which just so happened to be his first and last name. He was caught within a few days. During this whole case, I got to actually meet Mitch and he was indeed a happy old man, even despite what happened to him. I was using Craigslist as a means of selling some of my old, unused things I had stashed away in my house. I had plans to move out in the next few months, so I was just trying to organize what I needed from what I didn't need, and that's when I found my old motor tools. They were high quality and still functional, but I had gotten battery-powered ones to replace them not long ago. With no use for them anymore, I took a couple pictures and posted them up on Craigslist. I had listed a power drill, driver, and matching tool set for $80. Considering they weren't that old and still fully functional, this was a really good deal. It didn't take long to get responses. In just an hour, I got two replies to my post. One of them emailed me, asking if $50 would be okay, but I politely declined. The other reply stated that they were very interested and wanted to buy them that same night for the listed price. I agreed and said I was available at 5 if he wanted to swing by and pick them up. I never let anyone into my house when selling things. I'd always just bring the stuff out to my driveway and talk to them there. It was a well-trafficked neighborhood street so I wasn't worried about anyone attempting something out in the open. As I usually did, I was going to stand out in the driveway with the items a bit before 5 and wait for them so that I could make the transaction as quick as possible. But, just past 4.30, there was a knock at the door. I looked out, seeing a man standing there with his red car parked in the driveway. I opened the door a crack, asking who he was. The man said he was here to buy the tools that were on Craigslist and admitted to being early. I told him to hold on for a minute and to just wait in his car, as I wasn't expecting him yet. He hesitated, making the interaction more awkward than it should have been, but then he turned around. Once he walked away, I got all the tools together and met him at the top of the driveway. I had an outlet outside for him to test the tools with, and he seemed satisfied with them. About 20, he said while holding the drill. The deal was 80. I can do a little lower, but 20 is too low. I said nicely, though I was slightly annoyed because he had already agreed to pay $80 for them, and $20 was just a total ripoff. He put the drill down, and without even looking at me, he walked back to his car and drove away. I was confused and upset feeling like I'd been played and just had wasted my time. I got the tools back inside and just went on with my night, trying not to let myself get too upset about it. Really, it was just a small inconvenience. At least, that's what I thought. A couple hours later, I walked by the front windows and out of the corner of my eye, I saw that same red car. It was parked just down the road, three houses away from mine. I looked closely, trying to be sure that it was that same man, but nobody was inside it. 
It was an empty, parked car, so I had no way of knowing for sure. I convinced myself it was just a coincidence and carried on. Another hour would go by. I was just going on with my night, making food and watching TV, but then someone knocked on my door. I was a little shaken, but chose to ignore it and hope that whoever it was would go away. Obviously, the man from earlier was my first thought. Only 30 seconds passed before they knocked again. Hey, it's me. I decided I'll take the tools. I brought the money. He yelled from the other side of the door. I didn't believe him at all. It all came together in my mind that that car that I'd seen an hour ago was his, meaning that he'd been stalking my house all night. I didn't respond and instead called the police, informing them of the man's name and the car he had. The man called out several more times, saying he wanted to buy the tools, but then it went silent for a minute. I was still standing by my couch, looking toward the front door. Another minute passed. I wasn't sure what to do. The police were already on their way and would be here any minute, so I felt safe enough to be able to check out the windows. I quietly walked over to the window that was beside the door. But then suddenly, I heard something hit the side of the house with great force. The sound was followed by leaves rustling and footsteps running away. I looked out the window and saw the guy running with a limp down to his car. The police turned in at the perfect time though, stopping him halfway. It surprised me to hear that the man admitted to a lot. He said he planned on robbing me, but I wouldn't let him into the house, which complicated things for him. Additionally, he tried climbing the tree on the side of my house and jumping onto the roof, but he missed hitting the side and falling on his leg. The thing is though, he was armed with a knife, and the roof he tried to jump on was just under my second story window, which after checking, was unlocked. So, if he had made the jump, he actually would have gotten inside. He claimed it was just an attempted robbery, but claims are just that. I stopped using Craigslist, and even to this day, I lock every single window in my house, even the ones that I think are unreachable. Hi, my name is Jason, and when I was 10 years old, I had a stepbrother who I hadn't talked to in years, but I'm sure he wouldn't want his name out there, so I'm just gonna call him Brad. Me and Brad used to walk around where I lived and just mess around doing random things. At this time in my life, I was introduced to drugs and alcohol. I would say I was a troublemaker at the time. I would do stupid things like break into abandoned buildings and things of that sort. One day I had the idea to walk to the downtown area with Brad. My dad and stepmother were out on a date, so we took our opportunity to leave. From where I lived, it was about a 45 minute walk to get to the downtown area. We began our walk through the ghetto area that we lived in at the time, talking about the things we were going to do that day. A couple of options came to us, and we discussed them. We thought we could eat or go to an arcade with the little money we had. We finished our walk, and we made it to the dollar store, where we bought some snacks with the little money we had. We continued to walk eating our snacks until we found this abandoned looking building. I say looking building for a reason that'll make sense here in a second. We broke into this door by using a pocket knife that we had on us. Once we got into this building, there was the small room with a desk and cupboard in the corner of the room. We began to look through the things and we opened one of the drawers and we found a gun, which then gave us the it's time to leave feeling. We walked back outside and began walking down an alleyway beside this building where a man was standing at, and he was tall with a deep voice. He asked me and Brad why we were just in that building, which scared us. How could he have known we were in there? He told us to sit and wait, and that the owner of the building has to ask us a few questions. We were waiting for a little bit, 
which was a big mistake that I really wish we could take back. We then heard the sounds of tires squeaking against the pavement and an SUV stopped in front of the alleyway. The man from earlier jumped out of the vehicle and began running towards us. He immediately bolted towards the other side of the alleyway, which after a left turn was the sidewalk beside some building. We then kept running and a few seconds after we left the alley, the SUV came from around the corner still chasing us. We ran through a few more alleys and through our city park before we finally lost them. Once we did, we made our way back home still running. Once we got home, I got through the front door and I just fell to the floor and all I could do next was just cry. To this day, I have never told my parents, but I really can't imagine what those people would have done to us if they had caught us. I was attending a popular concert in the south side of Chicago last year. As most of you probably know, it's a pretty sketchy area down there, and the crime rate is really high. But the tickets were really cheap, and the concert was well populated, so I felt pretty safe. Plus, I decided to go with a couple of my friends. The concert was great, and we all really enjoyed ourselves, but we knew the drive out would be pretty bad with all the traffic. It was almost 10 p.m. by the time we got out of the parking lot and onto the main road. We realized pretty quick, though, that we were going to be on this road for a while, as the cars were barely even moving forward. Sitting there, my friends started to look up other routes to get back to our town, and they found one that could hopefully get us past all this traffic. After sitting in basically the same spot for 30 minutes, we agreed we would try the other route. We turned off the main road as soon as we could and began going through neighborhood streets. Surprisingly, there were a lot of people outside this late at night, just walking around or standing in their yards. This wasn't normal from where we lived, which was just a couple hours west. As we continued down these neighborhood streets, we began to notice that the people outside would watch us as we drove by. And then we also started to realize that we hadn't seen any other cars in probably 20 minutes. This got us a little bit nervous, and we all started to pay more attention. I asked one of my friends to check where the nearest main road was, and as he was scrolling through the map, my other friend pointed out a car at the end of the street that we were on. It was parked sideways, blocking both lanes of the road. I stopped the car immediately and backed out and got onto the road that we were on previously, then continued down there. We began to panic a little bit, trying to find a safe way out to a more public area with other cars. But just a few seconds later, we again saw at the end of the road a sideways car blocking both lanes. I stopped the car and I looked over at my friends. We were all looking at each other, clueless of what to do. It was too dark, and we couldn't tell if anyone was in the car up ahead, so we didn't want to approach it. As we were discussing our options, two men came up from one of the houses off the street. One of them stood behind the car, and the other one came up to my window. He signaled with his hands for me to roll down the window, and nervously, I rolled it down just a few inches. The man looked at each of us and scanned the inside of the car then asked me where we were headed. Just back to the highway, I said. He nodded and looked over at his friend, who started to walk over to the passenger side. There was a small moment where it felt like everything went silent and nobody moved. Then suddenly, both men grabbed the doors, trying to open them repeatedly. I reacted as fast as I could, putting the car in reverse as everyone was screaming. Just as I started to back out, the man tried to stick his arm through the gap in the window and even got stuck for a second as I pulled the car back before slamming to the ground. I turned around and floored it out of the street and went back to the way we came. We were all in total shock. 
I tried to stay calm, but I was shaking uncontrollably. We all agreed we would go back to the same way we came and just get on the highway from there. I think we were all pretty shaken by the situation, but I do think that I handled it pretty well. Luckily our doors were locked though, because I'm not sure if I'd be here right now if they weren't. My name is Erica, and I live in Tennessee. I grew up in a smallish town that, even though I love, it has started to become more dangerous over time. I actually have two terrifying incidents. The first one was when I was about 15 or 16. I was starting to take my usual walk, and right as I walked outside the gate to my house, I had noticed this man who was maybe in his mid-40s in a car, and he stuck his head out the window and he was just staring at me while driving down the road opposite of where I was walking. I continued to walk, and I got onto the street behind my house, and then the same man had turned around at some point, and he found me walking again, and asked if I needed a ride. I said I was fine, but he just kept persisting. I said that I'm just taking a walk, and that I'm fine, and he finally slowly drove off. As I kept walking, he had turned around a couple of more times or so, just to slowly drive beside me and stare. The last time he came back, he started making kissy faces at me, and he said I had a cute ass. At this point, I got really angry, and I told him I didn't care, and to go. He finally slowly drove off, and as soon as I saw him disappear, I booked it. I was crying and shaking, and then stopped running, because I realized I was halfway in between my house and a friend's house and I didn't know if I should risk going home and having him see me or run to my friend's house from the back way and have him take me home. I finally chose to just rush home, and I made it inside. The second incident was a closer call, I think, but for some reason, it didn't scare me as badly. I was taking a walk, and I was right across the street, and a caddy cornered me from my house. When I was about to cross the street, there was a typical white van that was driving up, and they had their left turn signal on to signal that they were turning down that road so that I could cross the street, I guess. So as soon as I crossed the street, instead of them turning, they immediately pulled up beside me, and the man on the passenger side opened the door and got up, but then immediately sat back down when he noticed I saw what he was doing. So to make sure they didn't realize it was my house that we were right in front of, I just kept walking instead of going inside, which made my heart sink because I was getting further away from my house, which would have made me feel safer, but I couldn't risk them knowing where I lived, so I kept walking, but I then hid behind a bush and just waited for them to drive off. After about a minute, roughly, they finally drove off, but not down the street they were originally going to. I then came out from behind the bush and ran inside my house. The main thing I kick myself for every time is not getting the license plate number or reporting it. Who knows if they did something to anyone else. Always keep some type of protection on you, like a gun, or at least the pepper spray. And please be safe. There's a park with a playground near my house that my younger sister and I used to walk to frequently. Used to, that is. We haven't walked there by ourselves after it happened back in 2021. For some background, my name is Sage, and I was 20 at the time. My sister Isabel was 6. We would regularly walk to this park since it was only 10 minutes away, and it was a good way to get some exercise. We also live in a fairly nice middle-class neighborhood with plenty of people walking on the sidewalks. The walk there was just like every other time, my sister and I just goofing around, not knowing what was awaiting us. When we got to the park, it was filled with kids and families that most likely had just left church and wanted to soak up the last bit of the sunny weekend. We strolled down to the small set of steps to the park and down the sidewalk to the first playground. The park is not very big, but it's separated into three sections of play equipment. Two of the sections are right beside each other on top of the incline that the park lays on, and the third section is farther away toward the bottom of the incline. 
My sister played on the first section's play equipment and decided she wanted to play in the swings at the third playground. So I gathered our things and we walked down. We played on the equipment there and that's when I noticed a man sitting at a picnic table next to the swings and he was staring at us. This caught my attention because one, he was fucking staring at me and my little sister with no emotion at all in his face and then two, he had an intimidating appearance and presence. This guy was six foot five easy, built like a brick house, and was probably in his forties. He was wearing a blue mechanics uniform and was a little grimy. His icy blue eyes are what freaked me out the most. I swear this guy didn't blink at all while watching us. Every time I looked back at him, his eyes were already locked onto mine and he never looked away or faked a half smile. He wasn't even trying to hide the fact that he was intensely watching us. Even though I had an off feeling about this man, I tried to shrug it off because I didn't want to judge him so quickly and so harshly. I thought maybe I was just overthinking it, so I tried my best to ignore him. We went to the swings right next to this man because she wanted to swing. It was the only one available, and I guess I didn't want to show this man I was scared of him. He was only a few feet away. The whole time though, I could feel his eyes on us and I could see him out of my peripheral vision. He wasn't moving a muscle and he adamantly continued to stare at us. Worse, he was staring at Isabel too with the same intensity. There was a little girl I hadn't noticed before several feet away who kept calling for her dad to look at her while looking at this man. So I assumed this was his daughter, but this guy didn't look at her at all or say anything to her. He was ignoring his own daughter just to stare at us, a random 20-year-old woman and a 6-year-old girl. I just couldn't ignore this gut-wrenching feeling anymore, and I knew this guy was a straight-up creep. But I wasn't going to lose face in front of this freak in case he tried to take advantage of me losing my cool. So casually, I told my sister we needed to find the sanitizer in my bag, so she helped me pull the stuff from my bag. I pulled out my taser that I carried with me at all times nonchalantly as we were searching for the sanitizer so we could clearly see that I had something to defend ourselves with. No reaction whatsoever from this man, just even more threatening staring. I could sense that he wanted me to know just how unfazed he was and he was even more determined now. After we found the sanitizer, I put the taser back in the bag, we used the sanitizer and then we walked up the hill to the second section of the park. The second section of the park overlooked the third section below us and also the parking lot right in front of it as well. I wanted to separate us from him, but have a clear view of him and where he could go. I immediately called my mom to pick us up because I didn't want this guy to watch us leave the park alone and on foot. I kept my eye on him by glancing every few seconds and he never broke his soulless gaze. My mom didn't hesitate to hop in her car. She stayed on the phone, and when I looked back to where he had been the entire time, he was gone. My heart dropped into the pit of my stomach, and my adrenaline made the blood pump like a war drum in my ears. I had no idea where he could have gone in those few seconds, and the little girl was gone too. We stayed where we were while I frantically scanned the park for this fucker. He couldn't have drove because I would have seen. I know he was hiding somewhere, watching us, but where? The woods next to the playground? A car in the lot? There were less people in the park at this point, and I was petrified for my sister and I's safety. Is he going to jump us and throw us into a car? Will this man be a turning point in our lives, condemning us to the dark fantasy that only a man like him could truly convey through his gaze? No matter what, this had to be the last time our paths would cross. I'd keep Isabel and I safe even if I had to do it kicking and screaming. Finally, my mom pulled into the parking lot and my sister and I darted to her car. She hopped out of her car to help get our stuff in. All of a sudden, our car started to pull out of its space and creep towards us until it was right next to us. It was that fucking psycho. He stared us down one last time and did the same to my mom, but this stare was downright sinister. I could tell that he was pissed off that my mom was there and that we ruined whatever twisted shit he had planned. 
My mom stared him down right back, because honestly, my mom's not someone to fuck with. He then peeled out of there, and we never saw him again. I think one of the creepiest parts is that I didn't see that little girl anywhere in his car, and I got a good look since he fully stopped his car to stare us down. I have no idea what happened to her, because he was alone there with her, and I saw no switch off at any point between a partner anywhere. She just kind of disappeared after I first noticed her. The only thing I can think of is that maybe he had her down on the floorboards of the car, or maybe it wasn't even his daughter and she just acted like he was. I hope she's okay wherever she is. I regret that we couldn't get his plate numbers, but at the end of the day, we did all we could to keep Isabel safe. Try your best not to lose your shit with people like him, because that's what they're counting on. Always be aware of your surroundings, and don't hesitate to get help or be the help, whether it be calling for help if you see something sketchy, or even pretending to know the vulnerable person or people being targeted. Stay safe, everybody. I used to work for a small trucking company that would deliver frozen product to stores across several states. For the most part, I would do three or four deliveries before heading back to the warehouse and then home. Every once in a while, though, we would have a long delivery route where we would end too far to head back that same day, so we would have to sleep somewhere overnight before heading back. Usually, I'd just pull the truck into a truck stop and rest for a few hours and then get back on the road. Anyways, I was scheduled for a long delivery this day, and I knew I wouldn't get back until pretty late the next day. I got ready and headed out. Nothing happened the whole way there. I drove down, unloaded the truck, and started heading back. It was pretty late though, around 1 in the morning. I figured I should rest for an hour or two before continuing all the way back. The last sign I saw for a truck stop said 40 miles ahead, so I still had a bit before getting there. I tend to space out for long periods of time when driving down long straight roads especially this late at night when nobody else is on the road. Though I saw something flicker in my side mirror. I looked over and noticed headlights shining from right behind the trailer, but I couldn't see the car at all. This usually means that the car is in my blind spot because it's too close to the back for me to see. I continued down the road at the same speed, waiting for the car to get into the other lane and pass me but to my surprise, he stayed right behind me. This was starting to really bother me, as I knew if I had to break for any reason, this guy was for sure going to hit me. The truck stop was just a few miles ahead though, so I tried to ignore them for the rest of the way there. Finally, I see the sign for the rest area and start to pull in. As I'm turning, I check my mirror and I see the car slow down a little, but then he continues to follow me into the parking lot. I honestly wasn't sure what to think at this point, but I figured I must have accidentally cut him off a while back, and he just wanted to yell at me about it. I've gotten a lot of angry drivers in my years of trucking, so I was pretty used to it, but I've never had anyone follow me like this. I pulled into an open spot and shifted into park. The car slowly trailed behind me, and continued to get closer and closer to the back before eventually stopping. Again, he was too close for me to see him, but at this point it was getting too weird. I got out and started walking around to the back to question them, though almost as soon as I slammed my driver door shut, they put it in reverse and drove away in a rush. I couldn't see too well, but I could tell it was an older man and the car was white and rusted all over. It looked pretty similar to one of those old police cars with the front bumper bars and everything. I stood out there by the back of the truck for a couple of minutes, making sure everything was securely locked and that he didn't come back. Then I got back in the truck and turned it off. I double checked all the doors to make sure that they were locked and did one quick glance out all the windows for any more cars. Then I laid back and closed my eyes. I woke. 
hearing a bang echo through my trailer. I checked my watch, seeing it had been almost two hours and was a little past 3 a.m. Then there was another bang, but this time louder. I looked over in the side mirror and saw a very faint shadow moving around towards the back. This time I got pretty freaked out. I grabbed a small knife that I kept in the middle compartment and started making my way to the back, but this time I left the driver door open as to not make any noise. As I got closer, I crouched down a little and looked under the trailer. I could clearly see someone standing right up against the back of the truck and their car just behind them with its headlights off. Once I saw that, a rush of fear ran through my body and I decided not to approach any further and instead shouted out to them. My voice was a little shaky, but it seemed to do the trick. They rushed into their car and sped off. Looking at the back door, there was scratches all over the lock and clear marks as if he was trying to cut it open. I looked around to see if any other trucks could have seen the incident, but the lot was pretty empty. After a couple minutes, I ended up just getting back on the road and headed home. Nothing else happened for the rest of the trip. I've always assumed the man was just trying to steal from my trailer, but obviously he didn't know that I was on my way back from a delivery and the whole trailer was empty. Anyways, it's still the most unnerving thing to happen to me during my years of trucking, and I still get paranoid sometimes with a feeling that a car might be following right behind me without me even knowing. I had just gotten out of work at 11pm and was heading back to my house. It's about a 45 minute drive to get home usually, as I live several miles outside of the city. It's always very quiet, and the roads are pretty empty once I start to get further out and closer to home. I always enjoyed the drives back from work. I found them peaceful and just a nice way to wind down after a long day. I was 20 minutes away from home, and just turned down a long side road that pretty much leads directly to my house. This was my usual route home that I'd been taking for years now, and I'd never had anything happen before. I will admit though, it was a bit of a creepy road at night. It was very dimly lit and the sides of the road were surrounded by a dense forest. Not to mention, it would often get foggy during the later hours of the night, making things only visible within a few feet ahead. Again though, barely anyone is on this road at night and there's no turns or anything, so visibility is never too much of an issue. Though a couple minutes down the road, I see through the fog a small blinking light. I couldn't really tell how far ahead it was or even what side of the road it was on. I slowed down and as I started to get closer, the light turned off completely. At this point, I was maybe going 15 to 20 miles per hour when out of the fog, a small car pulls out from the side of the road and stops directly in front of me. I tried to brake, but I was too close already, and my car tapped the back of theirs. I was kind of in shock at first as to how suddenly it all happened, but I noticed neither of our cars really had much damage. Not really knowing what to do, I opened my door and stood beside my car, waiting for them to get out as well. I could see them moving around in the front seat, but I couldn't tell what they were doing. As I stood there, I looked at his car, noticing how old and worn it was and that the headlights were all turned off. Eventually, a man got out of the car slowly and began making his way over to me. From what I could see, he looked like a middle-aged man and was a pretty large guy. I decided to start off and asked, Is everything okay? You pulled out pretty quick. He was acting a little strange, and looking all around and never making eye contact with me. After a couple seconds, he replied, Yeah, sorry. I wasn't really sure how to respond, but he was starting to really make me uncomfortable, and I didn't want to be out on an empty road alone with him. 
I told him that there was no real damage to either car, so I was going to get back on the road and head home. But as I began reaching for my car door, he told me to wait. He told me he wanted to check his car out for damage before I left. I said okay and stood next to my car as he looked at his back bumper. But then he started to walk around this car, pretending to look at it for damage, which was really weird because I had only tapped his back bumper. As he started to make his way to the passenger side, I saw a large figure get up in the back seat and start moving towards the door. I immediately got in my car and locked it as a man got out of the back door, and both of them began waving their hands at me, telling me to stop. I was panicking at this point and put the car in drive and went around them down the road. Looking in the rear view mirror, I could see their lights turn on through the fog. I could see their lights for about 30 seconds, but eventually they faded out. I pulled into a gas station that was about 5 minutes from my house and waited there just to make sure that they didn't follow me home. But the car never passed by. After waiting for 15 minutes, I headed home. I decided not to call the cops at the time, as I wasn't entirely sure if I was just overreacting or not. I'm still not sure what those people really wanted, but the more I think about it, everything about that situation felt wrong. I don't know what their plan was, but part of me feels like something very dangerous was about to happen if I had not gotten out of there in time. Another part of me wishes I had reported the incident, as I find myself wondering, what if they had stopped following me so that they could try and lure someone else into their trap? To start this off, I'm a 21-year-old female who's 5 foot 1 and 120 pounds. One night a few months ago, my dad and I were sitting at home waiting for my mom to get home from work so we could go get dinner. My mom called and told us that she would be working pretty late so we could go ahead and get dinner without her. We live about 15 to 20 minutes away from town and my dad told me then he didn't feel like going all the way to town and asked if I was okay with just going to Dollar General that's literally only 5 minutes away. I said sure and we hopped in the car and headed towards Dollar General. When we got there, I asked my dad if he cared if I went and got some coffee since I had to get up early for work the next day. He said that was fine and he let me know then he would be in the freezer section when I was done. Well, I go to their little coffee section and I start looking at my choices of coffee. That's when I then noticed a huge man, who honestly just looked like a homeless Santa Claus, staring at me. I returned to look at him, and he quickly looked away and pretended to look at stuff on the shelf. I went back to grabbing the coffee I wanted, when I noticed him staring again, but this time in my body. I glanced over again, and once again, he pretended to look at the stuff on the shelves. I'm a pretty small girl, but I have a big chest for my size, so I thought he was just being perverted. It honestly made me uncomfortable, so I just took what I already had and went to the chips aisle. I started looking for the potato sticks, and I honestly forgot all about the old man. However, about five minutes later, I noticed the same man beside me, once again watching me. I looked at him, but this time he didn't look away. He didn't smile or anything. He just stared. I got pretty freaked out, so I decided to go find my dad. I noticed him looking at some of the dollar mills, and I walked over to him. Now, for some reason, I didn't tell him about the man. At the time, I didn't want to make a big deal about it because I thought my anxiety was just up. For some context, I've panicked over stupid stuff lots of times before so it's not unusual for something small to freak me out. This is when my dad got really close to me and said, Don't make it obvious, but we need to casually walk over to the front desk. When I start walking, you stay right beside me. I asked him why, and what he said next made my heart drop. There's an old man watching you, he said. This then made me realize that I wasn't just being anxious. This man was actually up to something. 
My dad started to walk, and before I could even take a step, I felt a hand grab my arm and yank me back. The man actually tried to run away with me, but luckily my dad pulled his gun out and he aimed it at the man, yelling at him to let me go or he'd get shot. When the man noticed the gun, he dropped me and he made a full run for it. The police were called, but sadly, as a lot of these stories go, the man was never caught. Now, I used to go to this Dollar General all the time by myself. Usually, I didn't go with my parents. It scares me to think about what if this had been one of the times that I went alone. If it wasn't for my dad being there and bringing his gun, it's really scary to think about what would have actually happened to me.